Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. This is Energy in America, which we do every two weeks with Lou Pugliarisi, who is the CEO of EPRINC, Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington, D.C. And we have him here on the phone with VMIX Call. So, Lou, say hi to the people. Hi. I'm uh, very jealous of everyone. <laughs> I was just out there about two weeks ago. I saw you then. <laughs> and in fact, we discussed it. Our son came out of China for a holiday during the lunar holidays, and he's not been able to go back to China. So That's okay, actually, right now. You should be happy as his dad. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to do his job remotely. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about energy right now in, uh, in the, uh, the yin and yang. May I use that term of all the, the going on? Uh, what, what, is, what is happening in energy globally and in the economy and in energy security that we should be concerned about yeah. or that we what, should what feel I good wanted, about? Yeah, so I wanted to do is even though we have all this turmoil, both of the elections, uh, turmoil in global markets, the outlook for the U.S. in which the primary criteria for energy security has historically been the health of our petroleum sector, our reliance on foreign supplies, uh, our ability to have a degree of independence and diversity in our, in our energy mix, that those particular characteristics of the U.S. energy complex are looking exceedingly good right now. Now, I, I think some folks in the environmental community may think it looks too good. So I thought we'd do is just look at where we stand today as we're getting ready to go into these uh, debates in the election season, and then uh, talk about at least one of the candidates' plans of what to do about that. And that would be uh, former mayor of New York City, um, uh, Bloomberg. So uh, with that, uh, why don't we take a look at some of the pictures here? Yes. Give us a very good graphical presentation. So <laughs> great title. Once again, pardon? Great title. The title of this, yes. The title of this slide, Geopolitical Events Raise Prices Little, but Epidemics Greater Them. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about this last week, but uh, I want to show you this chart. And I think it shows the wholesale price for three fuels that um, uh, the drivers and uh, users of fuels in the Hawaiian Islands are familiar with. Gasoline, uh, distillate, and jet fuel, right? Now, the interesting thing is these are the price per gallon uh, wholesale price. As you will know, in the Hawaiian Islands, by the time you add taxes and uh, <clears throat> excise uh, requirements and different blending requirements, whatever they may be, the price will be much higher than this, right? So if you look at this uh, first picture here, on Geolo I think the interesting thing about this is, uh, so maybe we can bring this picture back up. Yes. So take a look at three events. I think it's very interesting. Uh, look at the yellow line, which is distillate or diesel fuel, right? On September 14th, the, it was an attack on Saudi production. The wholesale price of distillate rose rather remarkably, you know, mm -hmm. 20, 30 percent. Mm -hmm. But it retreated right away. Then uh, it increased again in, uh, you know, the, early in the year when uh, Qasem Soleimani, the uh, sort of field marshal of the Revolutionary Guard, was taken out by U.S. forces. And uh, it, you know, popped a little bit, but then began to retreat. And then you have this enormous drop that begins to take place uh, from the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So now is a good time to go out and fill up your tank. Prices are very cheap. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, one picture, at least, what's what's happening. And I think what you should take away from that slide is the enormous resilience of the world oil market, largely because of the massive amount of oil and gas production from the United States. Now, well, let's I, mean, take I think you can also take away from that slide the fact that yeah. people saw the coronavirus as having a, a serious effect on the economy. Uh, and I think they probably concluded that because it would have an effect on the economy, it was not immediately mm, 
resolvable uh, that, that, that world trade and the economies of the great nations would decline. And therefore, yes, so the demand would decline. Actually, and the real problem is China is now a major demand center. Actually, the real lesson uh, to me out of the coronavirus is we can no longer pretend that China's just out there by itself and we can ignore them or we don't have to come to some resolution. They are a big piece of the world economy. They're a big piece of world oil and gas demand. Mm -hmm. And you can see those numbers. Mm -hmm. And that decline in jet fuel also is associated with decline in tourist visits to Japan and Hawaii and any destinations. There was an enormously interesting story today in the Washington Post showing the what this has done to tourism. How many, we have over 100 million Chinese tourists now, not just traveling around Asia, they're going around the world. They have money and they are now locked up. They're not going anywhere. Yeah. So, so let me ask you a question about that last yeah. slide then. Yeah. Uh, I know, I know. Uh, well, you're into predictions. You're into prognostications. Yeah. Uh, and we know that the coronavirus is not going away all that quick. Uh, what happens to that chart in a month or two or three? Actually, I think uh, the market runs on expectations. And uh, some of these supplies will go into storage. And I think we'll have, uh, I, I'm a basically an optimistic person by my personality. And I, I believe- I can vouch for that. Few, <laughs> within the next few months, we're going to see some real progress on, on the coronavirus. And slowly but surely demand will recover. I don't think it's going to spike back up. It's going to be a long, slow slog mm -hmm. but uh it's uh yeah it's we, we've been through this before as we discussed last week so but I, I think the lesson what i wanted to sort of transmit from that picture is we are really the world is amply supplied we have enormous capacity and oil and gas whether we like it or not is an integral to the world's economy still remains integral. It's not so easy to get rid of it overnight, which we'll talk a bit about on the Bloomberg uh, initiative. Okay. So now if we go to the next picture, let's take a look at gas, natural gas. This is particularly, you can see here, uh, these two slides show you the, the, yellow, the yellow picture is kind of an estimate of the price of natural gas in a place called Henry Hub. It's, it is a real place, but it's also a general uh, market uh, location or market determinant for the price of natural gas, plus $3, which is roughly the uh, shipping, shipping cost to, so it's about 115% of the price of natural gas in the US, plus what it costs to move it to Asia, right? So you can see that's below $5. But remarkably, the spot price in Asia, the JKM, the, J the J Japan, Korean, uh, and uh, you know, Korean marker price for LNG is down below $4. You cannot make money selling natural gas from the United States at this price. But, you know, it's a kind of distressed market. So right now, Asia is able to take advantage of very, very low prices for natural gas. Uh, part of this, of course, is once again, the cratering of industrial demand in China. So what's the prediction on that one? Is it the same thing? Uh, we'll, I think we'll know, recover, but, but we're also oversupplied with LNG. And it's going to take several years for the overhang in LNG to get worked out. Mm -hmm. But long term, I'm very optimistic that we're going to see lots of natural gas, much of it replacing coal throughout the Asia Pacific region. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the next one is very interesting. It shows the US hydrocarbon platform continues to deliver. Now this is really US crude oil. You know, if you live through the 1970s or 80s, uh, this, this is such a remarkable change and I, I wanted to show it again i know we've we've talked about this several times because even in the midst of all this turmoil 
I wanted your 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 viewers to see. Look, even through the very beginning of 2020, now heading in 2020, U.S. crude oil production continues to grow. In fact, we are now a net exporter. We take all the product we take in and all the crude we take in and all the crude we produce and what we export. You divide those two. The U.S. is a net exporter to the world market. Okay. Then let's go to uh, one on, on the next one here on natural. The same picture is taking place for natural gas. You see, people are very. There's an old saw in the business is that uh, many folks in the environmental community love natural gas when it's expensive and short supply. They don't like it so much now that it's uh, plentiful and low cost. But once again, you can see this massive increase in natural gas production in the U.S., largely through advanced technologies. We are now a net exporter of natural gas to the world market. And I just think, just look, you look at how short a period of time, from 2008, 2009, it's just remarkable. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we are a major force in the world gas market. And we go to, and if you go to the next one, you can see here that uh, the, it's a little hard to tell, but if you look at this black line, uh, it shows you the net, the minus number means we are a net exporter to the world market. Mm -hmm. The pipeline exports are going entirely to Mexico, maybe a little bit to Canada. And the green is the LNG. So I, I just, this is worth about, if you take Canada and Mexico, I think we've talked about this, it's worth about a trillion dollars. And so against this background of wealth creation and energy security comes a huge debate on what do we do about this in terms of climate and energy. And I thought what we'd do is talk a little bit about what Bloomberg is going to be proposing. It'll be very interesting to see if that comes out in the debate tonight. Yes. But you can see here in the last picture kind of where the challenges are. So Bloom Bloomberg's a pretty smart guy, you know, he has a he knows a lot about what's going on in the world. But he, he realizes that the Green New Deal is a political non-starter. Now, as you know, the, uh, the Green New Deal was a proposal by uh, certain members of the Democratic caucus to eliminate oil, oil and gas within the next few years, eight to nine years, to halt all hydraulic fracturing, the technology that actually, the uh, technology of uh, horizontal drilling and the movement of high pressure water and fluids to open up the uh, uh, rock below the surface of the earth to extract this oil and gas. This is what has made the U.S. so successful and so energy secure. So I think the struggle is, okay, you want to produce less of this, but you know, how are you going to convince enough people in the United States that this is a good idea. So Bloomberg, for his credit, r recognizes that the Green New Deal is a very bad idea. You cannot alter this trillion dollar uh, opportunity for North America in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. But he is trying to find a way to move towards 100% clean energy by 2050. And he wants to cut emissions by percent by 20, the end of his second term. And that's impressive. The guy's 78 years old. He's already talking about two terms. <laughs> uh, life begins at 78. What can I do? Yeah. 75 is the new 40. I got it. So <laughs> he, will, he will shut down all remaining 251 U.S. coal plants. And... Uh, you know, Biden said, well, I'll just teach them to be coders. At least, <laughs> I don't think these guys are interested in becoming coders. I think he, at least Bloomberg smart enough to say, well, I'm going to work with community leaders and officials to assure that we have transition plans in place. He's vague about that. He is planning to curtail the drive for new natural gas plants. Now, the problem with that is, a lot of new renewable power is only possible 
if they have natural gas as a backup. And I think it's very interesting that, you know, such a technology guru like Bloomberg, he doesn't discuss nuclear power at all. He says he'll add all f uh, fuels, or subsidies for fossil fuels, but that's kind of a perplexing statement for me because fossil fuels generate anywhere from five to 10 billion, sometimes more direct revenue to the federal government. Fossil fuels today continue to make money for the government and most renewable fuels cost the government money. And then he's going to substantially increase research and development to about $25 billion a year, which is about four times the current level. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the democratic debate, how well this is embraced, whether he gets attacked because he's not doing enough, and should he become the candidate how he deals in the general election with these initiatives when we have all this other what many people in the u.s would consider good news about our energy security and the growth of our oil and gas production base well let's assume let's assume he sticks on that program let's assume he gets the nomination let's assume he wins uh is it doable is it doable politically? Is it doable socially? Is it doable technologically? So first let's think about the American system is not a parliamentary system. The founding fathers uh, set us up so that uh, they were worried about bad things happening more than they were worried about good things happening. So <laughs> it's hard to get things done. I do not believe uh, under any potential makeup of the U.S. Senate even one controlled by the Democrats, that such radical reduction in U.S. natural gas production or even halting all uh, leases or new leases on public lands, so that's a much easier thing to do for a president because he controls that without the Congress. Uh, he will have to get money from the Congress. And quadrupling spending to $25 billion is going to be very difficult. And I thought it's very interesting about Bloomberg is in nowhere in his initiative is he discussing a carbon tax or some kind of uh, adjustment for the cost of burning fuels which generate carbon dioxide. So I thought that was very, very interesting. So he is all sort of reading the political winds. I think that uh, shutting down the remaining 251 plants some many of those are going to close anyway because of cheap right. natural gas. Right. No big risk on that position. Really. But, you know, it sounds to me like some of the points of his program here, as to be discussed uh, in an hour's time, um, you know, will, will, uh, are, are intended to avoid political footfalls, are intended to avoid, uh, you know, nasty slings and arrows, from the various, um, you know, people on the stage here. Uh, and and I, think, I think he's going to do better with this than, than AOC would do with the new Green Deal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But he uh, and maybe the answer be... is some sort of compromise at the end. Um, but my, yeah, my question to that... you, Lou, is what are the slings and arrows they will throw at him in an hour's time? Oh, it's going to be an hour isn't even enough to get at it for him. <laughs> <laughs> they will first they will attack him because he's a billionaire. He comes from money and interest. He doesn't understand about the ordinary person. I mean there's a story that he used to have a portable air conditioner brought out to his SUV in a hot days in New York to cool it down before he got into it. <laughs> They'd hook up one of those you know those window air conditioners you use just you see in the small apartments and stuff, they would put it in the back window of the SUV and just run a big cable from outside. It's, it's, so it's great to be it. great. Yeah, that must be. <laughs> it does get hot in the summer in New York, Joe. Okay, so they're uh, going to criticize him for his wealth. And then he's got a political problem. He's got a political problem. He needs to win Pennsylvania. Okay, you can do some things with coal. You can't win Pennsylvania on a ticket of shutting down all the coal plants. Yeah. You're going to have trouble in Tennessee now. Yeah, in the South, Texas, Oklahoma, you don't expect to win those states. In Pennsylvania, North Dakota, 
well, those are pretty important to make, you know. Uh, Virginia, maybe he's okay. West Virginia, no. He's not going to win it anyway. Uh, curtailing natural gas. I think he's going to have a lot of problems with that. There's a lot of people that uh, have good stories on the benefits of natural gas. And, uh, yeah, there are things we need to do. We need to deal with fugitive methane emissions and flaring. So I think there might be a compromise there as well. And then finally, I do not think he's going to be able to ramp up uh, quadruple spending on clean energy. In fact, I don't even know how you'd spend that much money. We, you know, we, we're spending plenty now. I mean, well, I mean, Jeff Bezos. Know, I'm wondering if he's really money. proposing to states like Pennsylvania and other states that are invested in coal and all that, uh, a jobs program, a research program that brings people out of coal and into um, into developing clean energy. I mean, if you had, what is it, $25 billion, you could think of something. I know, for example, Lou, that if they gave us, you and me, $25 billion, we could come up with something. I know that. Because definitely, we might have something left over. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but I mean, he's got to have softened points, you know, to, to, yeah, to soften the hard he can, angles here. He can, what he can do that these other people can't do is he can tout his status as a businessman, as someone who understands how these things work. But, uh, you know, Bloomberg, it's kind of an interesting character. For example, he's a big believer in charter schools. But charter schools are anathema to a big wing of the Democratic Party. Yeah. The teachers' unions hate it, right? Yeah. He's a huge fan of charter schools. His yeah. daughter runs a massive program on charter schools. And he hasn't backed off of that. So it's going to be very interesting to watch how that plays out. I think he has a chance. I think he does have a chance. I think if we, if I were a Republican strategist, I would keep my eye on Bloomberg. He's a very dangerous candidate. I don't think that's true of uh, Bernie, but you never know. But yeah, we live I in would... strange times, and we live yeah. in strange times with with energy too. Because uh, you know, let me be simplistic and say. That if trade slows down, if the economy slows down, if the coronavirus keeps everybody at home so they can't drive and go places and travel, right, mm -hmm. and take mm -hmm. cruise ships and the like, that's got to affect demand on a long-term basis and maybe oh, yes. even more so profound than we hope. think. We have to hope that this plays out like mares and sars, right? That by summer, uh, it becomes clear it's under control that the economy start China starts to recover, that even though we don't get all the recovery for another year, expectations start to shift uh, people's attitudes, travel picks up. I mean, I'm going to look around. There might be some real bargains on travel coming up. So, Okay, but I wash your hands and wear that. a mask. Yeah. So, what, what, <laughs> <laughs> what, about, what about Trump, you know? Here we are in, in this crisis. Here we are in, you know, in the conversation about renewable energy, in the conversation about climate change. The whole country, yes, the whole world is talking about all these things. But is he addressing this? And does it matter? Well, um, Trump has a very specific view on this. And, of course, that view could change. But his view is that these climate agreements are multilateral agreements with other countries are kind of bogus strategy in which everyone else will cheat, will follow the rules and get screwed. So he doesn't like them. He doesn't like them. I mean, he once said it was a Chinese hoax. I don't think it's a Chinese hoax, but he has this view that a lot of aspects of the global agreement, if you like, or the, the all the characteristics of globalism and multilateral agreements have worked against the interests of the United States and specifically against the interests of the working class in the United States. And that is a very, whether it's right or wrong, for example, I do not believe global trade has been the biggest problem with manufacturing. I think it's much more, and, and, and to uh, sort of blue collar jobs, I think it's much more related to automation, opioid crisis, failure of certain kinds of education. But uh, those, I think the elites in our country did fail and have failed to address those problems. 
And Trump is what you get when that happens. I mean, he was the only one to talk about this. So in that sense, he's a probably smarter politician than you want to give him credit for. I, I, I agree with you totally. He's smarter than you give him credit for. Uh, and one of the very interesting things that he's threatened or maybe thrown as a trial balloon is the notion of cutting Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all, all the safety net programs. And I really wonder how that would affect, A, the economy well, see, I and B, fuel. I so I, maybe we should do the budget of one session because when I looked through the budget, I didn't really see, there were some cuts in certain aspects of entitlements, but Trump, unlike most Republican candidates, doesn't seem to be worried about the deficit. <laughs> so he has wisely, at least until now, stayed away from the social programs, right? Maybe he's going after food stamps or something like that, but on the whole, he has not attacked Social Security or uh, Medicare. So uh, I, I need to go look more carefully at the budget and see what's going on. Well, it's, it's, it's still unfolding. Because his political strategy has not been to do that. It's still unfolding, and you know, I mean, that you always say, uh, "Plus ça change, plus la même," or was it "Plus la même, plus ça change"? It's all the same. <laughs> exactly. The more the more it changes, the more it's the same. But, and also on these budgets, the president's budget never means anything. That's just like the opening shot to the Congress. <laughs> then the Congress begins to change it on the ways they like it, and then it's a long negotiation. Well, that's the joy of this show, isn't it, Lou? It's always yeah. changing. And you, you it's never know changing. whether the change you just looked at is the same as the one next time you talk. So exactly. I can hardly wait till our next show, two weeks hence. <laughs> and I hope you'll, you'll hold down your travel for two weeks. And I'm not going to anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward in any event. <laughs> Lou Pugliarisi of okay. EPRINC joins us on Energy in America every two weeks on a given Wednesday. Thank you so much, Lou. Thank you, Jay. Talk to you Aloha. soon. Aloha.